This morning, let me turn this other one on here. All right. We are going to begin a new sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount. So if you would take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to begin this morning by looking at verses 1 through 12 that deal with what's often called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Now, as I was looking through this passage of Scripture of Matthew 5 through 7, I was trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to approach this? Because, you know, each one of the Beatitudes could be a sermon. Or you could take them all together and have a sermon. So I, as I studied it out and thought through it, prayed about it, I felt like I just want to take all of them together. So we're not going to be here for 12 hours, uh, but we're going to cover these in a way that I hope will be understandable and encouraging to you uh, this morning. Um, let me pray for us as we begin. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to get into your word today. Lord, may it get into us and may we may it change our hearts, may it do its work that makes us to be more fully inform, informed, responsible, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, may we be encouraged today by these words from our Lord Jesus. And, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this passage uh, what I'd like to do is just read through it, the first 12 verses, and then we'll go back and we'll take it from the top. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you so as we go back to verse one and we kind of walk through this together this morning um, as i was studying this out um, i was asking myself okay what is what is how can we approach this passage in the most normative, regular, sensible, easy to understand way. And so that was my attempt as, as I began looking through this passage. And so we're just going to start verse 1 and walk through. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So Jesus had been, if you'd read back in chapter 4 at all, he had had a lot of people following him around. And he finally reached a point where he felt like he needed to take some time out and teach them some things. And so he saw the multitudes, and it says he went up on a mountain. And I don't know how high this mountain was, if it's really what we would call a mountain today, or if it was just a hill. But it was some elevated place, some platform from which he could kind of amplify his voice and be heard there among the people. Sort of like I'm up here on this platform today. If we didn't have microphones and stuff, it would help you to hear me better because I'm up here. Not just because I want to be up front or be seen. It's just a good place to do that. Now, there's another version of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke's Gospel but Luke refers to it as the Sermon on the Plain. And it's not exactly the same either. There's some different teachings. Not everything Jesus says here in Matthew is in the same order it's in Luke. Not the same words aren't exactly used. So it's likely that this was another time that he taught similar things, but not in a in a in the exact same way. So when you're comparing this to Luke's version in chapter 6, 
um, you're going to see some differences. You won't see contradictions, they're just different. So he went up on the mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now notice who he's teaching primarily. It's not so much the multitudes at this point as is teaching his disciples. They're sort of in the front row. They're sort of the inner core of the people that are around Jesus. Now the others are certainly there. They're listening. On the outside, they're, they're hearing what's going on. But he's teaching his disciples. And he opens his mouth and taught them. And so, you know, we call this passage the Sermon on the Mount. And I, that's good, and it's certainly understandable as you read through it that this certainly could have been a sermon. And there ought to be teaching in sermons. I feel like good sermons are full of good teaching. And that's what I try to do each week at least. But let's, let's get into these Beatitudes, these blesseds are. And what does it mean to be blessed? I think you know what it means to be blessed. I don't know that I really need to explain to you what that means. But another way to translate the word blessed here is the word happy. Happy, satisfied. Um, you're, you're good, everything, you know, you're, you're content. That, that's what it means. Knowing that God's, God is God and he's gonna take care of all of this. And so as we look through, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Uh, when you're reviled and persecuted and have all kinds of evil said against you falsely, these are qualities that should be found in those who are following Jesus. And Jesus, remember, he's talking to his disciples. So he's saying, look, you are blessed, my disciple, when these things happen to you. When, when things come into your life and you're caused to be poor in spirit or you mourn or you're, merc or you, you, you're meek or you're persecuted, all of these things. These things should be qualities that are found in the lives of those who are following Jesus, in those who have their hope in him and hope in him to save them and keep them and take them to heaven and make everything right. And here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to follow me as we walk through each one of these. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does that mean? Well, when you think of the word poor, it's lacking something. It's being deficient in something or not having enough, coming up short, um, running on empty. Um, it's, it's a situation where you'd have already given up if not for God. Um, it, uh, someone who's poor in spirit is not proud. Um, these poor in spirit are people who realize and recognize that they bring nothing to commend themselves before God. To, for, for nothing. To, for God to save them. That they don't have the strength and ability within themselves to keep themselves saved. It's like that line in that old hymn, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. That's being poor in spirit. Or a hymn that we often sing here in our church, come ye sinners poor and needy. The, the third and fourth verse of that hymn says, come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. And that's someone who's poor in spirit. They know they're not well. They know there's something wrong. They know they lack and they need somebody to save them. Or the, or the fourth verse, let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. 
All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. So, that's, those are the words of someone who is poor in spirit. Or that hymn we sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So someone who is poor in spirit recognize their complete and utter need for and dependence upon God. They don't have it in themselves. They lack it. They're poor, but that's why they go to God. That's why they look to him. Well, what about those who mourn? What does that mean? Well, I think we would all agree that there's a lot to mourn about in this world today. Is there not? Sin and its effects, brokenness, death, disease, destruction, disasters, dysfunction, hurt, heartbreak. We mourn those things. We mourn when people don't choose what's best, when they choose to live for themselves rather than for God. We mourn when justice is not done. We mourn when wrong seems to win out over right. We mourn when people suffer and hurt for doing what's right. I mean, I think we all know that this world is messed up. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That's what Paul said. So we have hope beyond this life. And we mourn as believers because we don't like the world, we don't like the way it is. But we know there's something better to come. Well, what about being meek? What does that mean? Blessed are the meek. Who is a meek person? What does it mean to be meek? Well, it means to be gentle. It means strength under control. Here's what it doesn't mean. Meekness is not weakness. It is not weakness. It's not cowardice. It's not rolling over and taking it. That's not meekness. A meek person is gentle. A meek person does not insert themselves. They aren't attention getters. A meek person is someone who knows it's not all about them. They're calm, they're kind, they're considerate. They prefer others. They're mild. They don't butt in. They faithfully serve. These are those people who are reliable, dependable, not selfishly ambitious, not boisterous, but they bear things patiently. They receive injury with the assurance of God's vindication. A meek person knows that vengeance is God's and he will repay. That's what a meek person is. Well, what's the next one say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is that all about? What does that mean? Well, as I've already said, you know, we know the world's messed up. We know the world's broken. It's under a curse. And there's a lot going on in this world that we just don't like. And we know God's not happy. In fact, we desire the Lord to come quickly and make things right. We hunger for that. We want that day to come. We want the trumpet to blow and the angel to shout. And we want, we're ready. We want that to happen. We look forward to that. We thirst for that. We hunger for that. We want God to make things right. And only the Lord can fill that hunger and thirst. He is righteous and holy. And we want his kingdom to come. We want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want him to make all things right and for justice to be done and God's holiness to be exalted. Do you hunger and thirst for that? You're, then you're hungering, thirsting for righteousness. How about being merciful? What does that mean? Well, over in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus says this. He says, be merciful as God your Father is merciful. Live like God. Be godly in the way you live your life. In other words, in that, be merciful. Mercy, here's an interesting kind of sideline to this. It's, it's helped me as a Christian. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. It's not getting what we deserve. If we got what we deserve, <laughs> none of us would be here right now. We'd be in hell right now, busting it wide open. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace, I mean, what do we not deserve? We don't deserve to be saved. We don't deserve God's salvation. But he gives that to all who will call upon him. Did not the, uh, the publican go up to the temple and pray, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And then Paul wrote in Ephesians, forgive one another, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Think about that. How has God in Christ forgiven you? How much has he forgiven more than you can count. So, do you have a limit on how much you're going to forgive somebody? Didn't Jesus say, was asked the question, Lord, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus said, or, or the, the person asking said, up, up to seven times? <laughs> Jesus said, I tell you no, but 70 times seven. Now you do the math. You know what it is if you can do math. I can at least do that 490 times. Did Jesus literally mean we should forgive 490, but when the 491 rolls around, that's it. No more forgiveness. I think Jesus was just saying, look, there's going to be more times than you can count you're going to need to forgive somebody. Don't, don't keep a ledger. Just forgive. That's what God does for you. And there is no other way that we imitate God more than when we show mercy, because he's merciful. Amen. Amen to that. Mercy is not earned or deserved. Neither is grace. Otherwise, it's not grace, but it's wages. It's something you can earn. I mean, we're just saying this morning, his mercy is more. And all of us on this side of eternity are better than we deserve to be. If we were all honest and we understand what the Bible says, we would have to say that we're all better than we deserve. Those of us who are saved, who cast ourselves upon the mercy of God because of our sin and who've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus, we know we're better than we deserve. But those who are not saved don't realize that this is as good as it gets for them. The best this world has to offer is the best they can experience. In fact, many of them are probably mad at God because things aren't better for them than they are. They think they deserve more. But none of us do. So that's the merciful. What about the pure in heart? These are those whose minds and motives and principles are pure. Who seek to not only be externally pure in their actions and in their words, but who also desire to be internally pure in their heart, in their mind, will, and emotions. Now the Bible says that God looks, that, that man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the what? On the heart. That's right. So being pure in heart. And then the peacemakers. Who are these? These are those who strive to prevent contention, strife, and war. These are the mediators, the reconcilers, the diplomats who work at keeping the peace. 
Their first inclination is not to strike or lash out, but to seek understanding and pursue peace as far as it is possible. Amen. Amen. These are also those who desire everyone to be at peace with God and to have the peace of God in their heart. And then there's verse 10, the persecuted for righteousness sake. What's, who are these people? This is when you suffer for doing what is right. All those who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Standing for the truth, preaching the whole counsel of God, calling sin, sin, being clear, biblical, and not apologizing for it, standing on the word of God, not because you hate people, which is a lie, but because you love them and you want them to repent and believe the gospel and be saved. That's why you do that. And if you get in trouble for that, you're being persecuted for righteousness sake. When, when God's people are actively pursued because they've decided to obey God rather than men, that's being persecuted for righteousness sake. When God's people are pursued because they've decided not to bow the knee to the world's idols, but have said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This active pursuit of Bible-believing, Bible-practicing Christians, um, this, this desire to enact laws against them under the guise of hate speech, or laws where if someone says something to hurt someone's feelings, like not referring to a male as he when he wants to be called a she, or they or them, or whatever it is now, I don't, can't keep up with it. To be punished for speaking the truth in love and out of a desire to keep the commandments of God so that we don't bear false witness against our neighbor, that's being persecuted for righteousness sake. And then related to that is what you find in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Whose sake? For Jesus' sake. Blessed are you when that happens. Now, it might not feel blessed to us, but in the eyes of God, we are. We're falsely, when we are falsely accused for Jesus' sake. For whose sake? For the Lord's. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The one in whom there is salvation in no other. Our God is a God of truth. He cannot lie. He does not deceive. The truth will ultimately prevail. One can only kick against the goads for so long before you lose. God is undefeatable. He is unchangeable. And he is unmistakably clear that he is going to judge the world in righteousness by Christ whom he raised from the dead. So do you wanna know what the world thinks of you and your truth? and of Jesus? What did they do to him when they had the chance? They crucified him and they buried him. They falsely accused him, like he said they will or could do to us. Pilate found no guilt in him, but allowed it to happen anyway just to keep the mob happy. And so Jesus was beaten, bruised, he suffered, bled, and died, and was buried. But three days later, three days later, listen, Jesus was not buried in a family grave. Jesus didn't buy a grave plot. No, he borrowed one 
for three days. For three days. The stone was rolled over the grave and was sealed with a Roman seal. But on the third day, the women went to the grave and the stone had been rolled away. And an angel told them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen just as he has said. Amen. Listen, this world will have its temporary wins, but God will win the war. The battle belongs to the Lord and we are on the winning side. We cannot and will not ultimately lose. That's why we have hope both now, today, in this life now and in the future, in the life to come. Amen. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. Now, I know what time it is, I see the clock, you're probably looking at your watch, but we, we, we're gonna finish. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to go back and look at each one of these descriptors. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, all of those right there. And look at the result. We didn't even look at that part. We just looked at what those meant. But look at the result, the end, the outcome for them. Remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples primarily. He's saying, you're blessed if you have these attitudes, these qualities, in your life. So let's look at the end, the result, the outcome for them. Some of these, we as his disciples, will experience now partially, but we will all experience fully in the life to come. So what about poor in spirit? He says, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit because yours is the what? Kingdom of what? Heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Are you looking forward to heaven? I hope so. Amen. Amen to that. What is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of God undeterred by sin and where sin never more occurs. That sounds good to me. I don't know about for you. So the poor in spirit have the kingdom of heaven. But what about those who mourn? There'll be what? Comforted. Amen. Who needs comfort today? Who wants comfort for eternity? Amen to that. What about the next one? Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. Now you're like, why? Why would I want that? I don't like the earth the way it is. Because it's not going to stay like this. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, Paul, uh, Paul wrote Timothy, let me read this, 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12. He says, this is a faithful saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. That's going to happen. When you inherit the earth, you inherit it the way God is going to have it when it's new. You're gonna be ruling and reigning with the Lord. What, what about uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? They shall be what? Filled. Filled. They won't need to hunger and thirst for righteousness because everything will be made right for all eternity and we will be filled. I look forward to that. How about the merciful? What will they get? Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> We need mercy. And for all eternity, we will experience, everything we experience that's not hell is mercy. And then the pure in heart, they shall what? See God. see God. Where are we gonna see God? In heaven. 
We will see him just as he is, face to face with Christ my Savior. And then those who are peacemakers shall be called what? Children of God. Amen. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Galatians 3, 23, I think. You are all sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus elsewhere says, love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and you will be sons of the Most High. I mean, think about that. How often does God love his enemies? All the time. That's why salvation is possible. How often does God do good to those who don't care about him? Or to anyone? All the time. How, how often does God lend, hoping for nothing in return? Happens all the time. So we're more like God when we do things like that. When we're, the uh, Bible says that we are, we are like God who is patient, desiring all to come to repentance. And then we'll close up with uh, those who are pure, persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. We already saw that with the very first one. And then he says in verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Look at what he says. Rejoice. Usually we don't want to do that. We want to complain. But he says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's what my version says. Usually we're exceedingly mad or sad, but we, he says be, rejoice and be exceedingly, exceedingly glad. We've got to somehow wrap our minds around what, what's really true, what's really waiting for us, whose we really are, and we can do that. Why, why can we rejoice and be exceedingly glad? For great is your reward in heaven. So, let me summarize this way. If we live for the Lord, we can expect trials and tribulations and persecutions because of the offense of the gospel. People get offended when we tell them they've sinned and are not good enough to go to heaven. I get that. People like to think they're good. They get offended when we tell them they can't save themselves. They get offended when we tell them not to trust in their own righteousness because they don't have any, but trust in the righteousness of Christ who loved them and gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of all who will believe in him. So if the world crucified the perfect one who was truly God and truly man, what do you think they'll do with you when you decide to stand up for Jesus and you're not perfect? They, they're not gonna like it. But Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Remember to rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Peter writes this, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and reverence having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So as we close, we've looked at these Beatitudes. If you claim to be a Christian, let me ask you, are these qualities, of, are these descriptions real and present in your life? Are they, are they there? Do you see them? Do they describe you as a Christian? If so, then you should have full assurance of faith and continue pressing on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He who promised is faithful, the Bible said. Commit your way unto the Lord, be faithful unto him, and he shall bring it to pass. Because in Jesus Christ, you have the promise of entering the kingdom of heaven, 
comfort for all eternity, inheriting the earth, being filled, obtaining mercy, seeing God, being called the sons of God, and you have a great reward in heaven. That's what we have waiting for us. And if you're not a Christian, you need to be. What are you waiting for? I'd like to talk with you about that if you're not saved or you're confused or not sure. My contact info is on the bulletin. Catch me. Let's talk soon. I'd love to pray, uh, to, to pray for you and talk with you about that. So we'll stop there and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity of studying your word today. Thank you for these great Beatitudes. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus, Lord. This is not all there is. There's more to come, and it's going to be so much better for those of us who know you. God, we thank you for that. Help us to exhibit these attitudes in our hearts and our lives, and help us to have the hope of those who have these attitudes of the kingdom of heaven and all the other benefits that come with a part of being a Christian. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.